Can I get your phone number? <laughs> what's up, Hope Chapel Connor? Oh, man, what's up, Hope Chapel Connor? Yeah, what's going on? It feels good to be in the house of God, amen. I love what Helen says. So, yeah, we went to a church, and we had everyone wore white. Everyone wore white, and then white hats, white outfits, and stuff. But when I came into a relationship with the Lord, I realized that God is not after the outward appearance. He looks at your heart. Amen. There was a story when Jesus showed up and he saw this fig tree and he said, he said, I'm hungry. I want to go to this fig tree and get me some figs. Well, he showed up to the fig tree. Guess what happened? No figs. Right? And so it had the appearance of godliness, but it denied the power thereof of Holy Spirit. And I'm just so grateful that y'all just don't look the part, but you are the part. That Jesus implanted you with grace and mercy and love and and even though you argued on your way here, you're running late, that doesn't matter because you let never allow life and circumstances to speak louder than the truth of who you are. You are loved by Jesus, period. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. So if you've been, if you've been keeping tabs with us, man, if, if, if you're like a social media junkie, uh, uh, you know that, that we're, we're on a message series. I'm still trying to buy a printer, so... Uh, <laughs> We are on a message series uh, titled, Why Church? Why do I need to come to church? Why did God design a church? Do I even need to go to church? Besides, church is just full of goody two shoe people who's perfect. That's not true. I used to believe in the lie that I had to get my life right before I came to church. Why? I realized that the truth is I need to go to church in order to get my life right. Because the church creates an atmosphere where God's divine nature and divine power can touch your hearts. The church is a conduit. For Holy Spirit. And so we've been on a message series called Why Church? And it's really a series on perspective, not losing focus on who we are, what we're doing here, and where we're going. And we opened up this message series with a, a message on servants. Amen? Uh, uh, you never know how much of a servant you are until you're treated like one. I'm a servant of God. I'm a servant of God until you're treated. You'll never know how much of a servant you are until you're treated like one. Well, Hope Chapel Kona is not a church that sits on a table. Hope Chapel Kona is a church that serves. Why? Because Jesus said, if you want to find me, I am amongst the servants. And so the greatest love of all is the love of he who would lay down his life for his friends. Uh, we're a serving church. Somebody say amen. The church is also a place for hope and healing. It's a habitat for hope and healing. It's a place where an environment of, 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 of a, that is an environment or an atmos atmosphere saturated by praise that allows Holy Spirit to touch, change, and transform hearts. In the Old Testament, uh, uh, the book of Ezekiel, they said that priests used to come in from the south, but they will never go back to the south. They will exit to the north. And if a priest would come in from the east, he will never go back to the east. He will exit on the west. That's what the church is. It allows you a place, a place of sanctuary where old things have passed away. You come in here, God does a 180 on your life, not a 360 because you're going to go back, but a 180 on your life. And the moment he changes you, you leave renewed, restored, refreshed, and with a smile on your face. Somebody say amen. So that's what the church is, is all about. Now, here's something for you. Jesus, he's coming back, but he's not coming back for Walmart. He's not coming back for Starbucks. I'm sorry. He's not coming back for a caramel macchiato. He's not coming back for Costco. <gasps> Costco, I can't live without Costco. I need Costco. Without Costco, we're going to die. He's not coming back for a Costco. He's coming back for a church. He's coming back for you and for me. Nothing in this world matters to God other than your salvation in him. He's coming back for us. Somebody say amen. And so that's why we do church. Well, today, what I want to do is I want to take what we do here, and I want to put it outside of these walls in what I call your house. There's no pain like family pain. And if there's one place we ought to do church, is in your living room. <laughs> and so I, I'm gonna t I want to talk to us today about that. Uh, the title of today's sermon is Doing Church as Family. And the goal of today's service, the goal of today's sermon is for us to shine the light in the one place where we find it super hard to shine, 
at your home when your baby's kids are driving you nuts and your wife's been yelling at you all day and you feel like you've done nothing today. That's what I want to talk to us about today. I want us to take this light here and I want us to have church at home. So the title of today's sermon is Doing Church as Family. There was a story about a about a young daughter, and she goes up to her mom, and she says, Mommy, 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 where do humans come from? And, and Mommy said, well, that's easy, sweetheart. Uh, from Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had children, and their children had children, and their children had children. So we all descended from Adam and Eve. And the daughter says, oh, okay, great. A couple of days later, the daughter goes to the dad, and she says, hey, dad, where, 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 all, where do humans, humans come from? And the dad said, well, that's easy, sweet, sweetheart. All the humans came from monkeys. Monkeys uh, uh, eventually, over many years ago, evolved into human beings. And so all the human beings came from, from monkeys. So the daughter is now confused. So she runs back to her mom, and she goes, Mom, how come when I ask you where do humans come from, you say from God and Adam and Eve, but when I go to Dad and Dad says we, humans come from monkeys? And this is what Mom said. Well, that's easy, sweetheart. I was talking about my side of the family. Your husband or your dad was talking about his side of the family. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You, you, you see, families aren't perfect. Amen. There's no perfect family. But they are precious to God. They are precious to God. And the goal of today is to have us take this, the joy, the laughter, take it and put it in our living room and shine the light of Jesus to our families. And so what I want to do is, if you bought your Bible, turn to me uh, uh, with the book of, to the book of Luke chapter 8, uh, specifically verse 27. If you didn't bring your Bible, don't worry. We're going to put up some scriptures on, on, on the, um, so don't yell at your husband about forgetting the Bible on the dinner table. Um, we're going to put some scriptures here. And so what I want to do is I'm gonna, I want to talk to us about this story about a demon-possessed man, and I'm going to attach that story to doing life or doing church as family. And we're going to extract the precious gems from this story on how we could do church at home. And then I'm just going to, at the end of the sermon, I'm just going to give you some practical advice, just some advice that you can take home and you can apply this sermon to your house. Because one of the disadvantages or the, 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 the tragedies of, of sermons is people leave here and they have no idea what the pastor talks about. So I'm going to give you some practical advice on things you could do today to help with doing church as family. Somebody say amen. Amen. So, so in the book of Luke chapter 8, we find that Jesus and his disciples, they cross what's called the Sea of Galilee. And they head southward to a place called the Gadarenes. In fact, the, the word Gadarenes is from the Greek word that means a, a place of reward. So, so he takes his disciples to a place called the Gadarenes. And the moment they landed, they stepped foot on land. The Bible says that they were confronted by a demon-possessed man. Now, this demon-possessed man, uh, it said that he didn't have clothes on. <laughs> and he had chains on him. And, 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 and he wasn't in his right frame of mind. But here's another part that's, that, that's interesting. It said that this man was not living in a home. He was living in tombs. So picture that. So let's, let's take it from the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 27, and uh, I'm just going to read it out for you. And when he, Jesus, stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes. If you got a Bible, underline that. He wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in tombs, and underline that. So kind of, I, I could imagine this guy. He's away from family. He's away from home. He's away from a place where love covers a multitude of sin. He's aw away from a nurturing environment, an environment that cares for him, an environment that comforts. He's away from home. And I've realized two things. The first thing is this. Satan will always pull you from a place of abundant life to a place of dead life. Satan will always pull you from the comforts of your home Remove you from your family and cause you to dwell among tombs and cause you to dwell amongst hell and cause you to dwell amongst death. Satan will take you from a place of life more abundant, remove you, and put you in the alleys of life. Here's the other thing. 
Well, the man had no clothes on. Satan is always in the business of exploiting your shame. He wants to reveal your shame. But in Christ, he covers you with, a, with love. The only place you should be naked is in your home anyway. <laughs> I remember my dad used to check me, man, when I used to leave the house. He used to check me all the time. He said, what? You ain't wearing that. Oh, well, dad, it's Jason Lamar. He ain't got a shirt on. Go back in and, and, and put on a nice shirt. Act like you got parents that care about you. My dad used to put me in check in terms of what I, what I wear and leaving the house. I used to, back in the days in Samoa, we used to grow our hair, but just specific parts of our hair. Like, we used to grow like this piece. Like, for me, it was, it was, we used to grow all our bangs, but then there was one piece where I, I grew just one piece of my hair, and it got super long. And what I would do was to hide it from my dad. I used to gel it, like just put gel, and I'd slick it back to make it look like it was part of my hair. Well, one day we were going to church, and I didn't put enough gel on my hair. And so it was kind of doing this. <laughs> it was kind of doing this, and my dad said, Hey, bam, tell me. Not on you. Oh, bam, come here. That's tongues interpretation of tongues. Hey, come over here. What, what is that on your head? He said, what dad did that? So I try to slick it back. I try to slick it back. He goes, come here. He grabs my hair. There's eight siblings. So he said, hey, you, go get a scissors. And so he grabs a scissors right before church, y'all, right before church. Don't you ever leave the house like that. The only thing with the tail belongs in the barn. <laughs> yes, dad. Yeah, my dad used to put me in check. Yeah, the point is this. Satan will always exploit your nakedness, your vulnerability. God works the opposite way. He doesn't want to exploit your shame. He does want to bring healing in those areas of your broken areas of your life. And he doesn't like blast it on media. Multitude of love covers a multitude of, or, of sin. Love covers a multitude of, of sin. And so here, Jesus sees this man, and Satan has just taken him out of his home, living in death in tombs, and he's naked and not in his right mind. A long story short, uh, the demon-possessed guy says, Jesus, what are, you, what are you doing here? Are you here to torment us? And Jesus asks him, what is your name? Watch that. What is your name? Now, in the next verse, in the book of, of Luke, chapter 8, verse um, eight, verse 30, it says this. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And, and do you guys remember what he said his name was? Legion. Yeah. He said, my name is Legion because I have many demons in me. So he was identifying himself by a name that his parents didn't give him. He identified himself by a name that Satan gave him. You see, when you isolate yourself from your house and your family, you're going to begin to look like your surroundings. You're going to begin to identify yourself by a name that was not given to you by your parents. He said, Legion. I met a lot of hardcore cats in my life. Just kidding. SOS. <laughs> and when I'd ask him, I said, hey, bro, what's your name? He goes, Ghost Rider. <laughs> what? G Ghost Rider. You ride ghosts? <laughs> no, nah, man, just ghosts. I said, did your parents give you that name? He said, no, no, it's my hood name. It's my street name. And so people in society, society has this crazy way of putting labels on you where you start believing that that's who you are. How many of you have been labeled by society? Incompetent, unable, unfit. You're me, it's not more short. The womb. How many of you have carried a label? How about this? How many of you who are so precious in the eyes of Jesus, but you walk around with the label that says for sale? Jesus has already purchased you. You are his. But you're longing for something or someone else and trying to fill a void that only Jesus can fill. You see, the enemy loves to put labels on you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got a name. Come on now, you got a name. And it's not Ghost Rider, it's not Fitty Stan, it's not Tupac, it's not, it's none of, you got a name. You have a God-given name that was given to you at your home, at your family, from your parents. 
you got to tell your neighbor, you got a name. It ain't, ain't legion, amen? It ain't legion. So, so Jesus now confronts this man who Satan has taken away from his family, taken him away from his family into a tomb. And he who identifies himself as legion. Well, long story short, Jesus does the amazing. He casts all the demons and he casts the demons inside these swines or these pigs. And these pigs run to the Sea of Galilee down the hill and they all drown. And the word of God says that once that man was delivered from all the demons, they say that people saw him sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right frame of mind. Yay! Isn't Jesus awesome to restore the individual back to his created value and his created purpose? If you don't believe me, then let me just read it to you directly from the word of God. In Luke chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, it states this. Now the man from whom the demons had departed. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the verses before that. I didn't write that down. That's your homework. But I promise I wasn't lying. That's actually in the Bible. Now, 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 I want to take it a little further. So this man was delivered. Signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. So, so, so he was like, I'm signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. And them young, young kids in here like, what, what you doing, man? This, this right here, this right here got that right there. That, <laughs> this right here got that right there. <laughs> and so this man was signed, sealed, and delivered. And, and so th th then this is what happened. So the guy who was delivered by Jesus wanted to go with Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to follow, I want to follow him. Follow him wherever he may go. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be the 13th disciple. <laughs> Watch what Jesus said. Now, this is where we hone in to this, to this, to this message about doing church as family. In the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, the man from whom the demons had departed begged Jesus that he might be with him. But watch what Jesus says. And this is this captures the heart of Jesus for family. Jesus said, Jesus sent him away. He said, no. But this is what Jesus said. Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. <laughs> Jesus, I want to follow. Uh-uh. Return to your house. Oh, Jesus, I want to be the 13th. Nope. Return to your house. Jesus, I want to hang around with Peter James. Nope. Return to you. Jesus, I want to make disciples. No. Nope. Return to you. Well, Jesus, I want to be on the worship. No. Nope. Return to you. Jesus, I want to preach. No. Nope. Return to your house and tell your family all the good things that the Lord has done for you. Come on, somebody get excited. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote this down in my devotions. Out of all the places that you do church, make sure you never neglect the most important place to do church, your home, your family. And so if you're taking notes with me, I jot this down. I said, family is a first ministry. If, if you've been preaching the gospel, you know that when you, if your house all busts up, it's hard to get the word out. Or if you're in worship and and, 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 and your wife looking at you like you ain't all that, you think you could sing you all that? You ain't nothing. I'm trying to concentrate, babe. The word of God says that a house divided by itself shall not stand. So the most important thing, your first ministry of them all, is church at home. Do not neglect shining the light of Jesus at home. You see, the answers in life are not found in the safe house or not found in the white house. It's not found in the church house. It's found in your house. And when you come to grips and you come to terms that, you know what? All that stuff happening around me today, as for me, in my house, I will. Do not neglect doing Jesus in your living room. Can somebody say amen. Amen. So here's just some three practical advice. Don't worry, I won't take too long. It's just going to take me another four hours just to preach the gospel. It's all good. Don't worry. 
you could social distance out there. <laughs> so, so what does that mean, Bam? Okay, okay, so I got to do church at home. Okay, got it, understood. What do I need to do? Give me something practical, something that I could apply today. Okay, if you're taking notes, jot this down. Number one, do not forsake the dinner table. Do not forsake the dinner table. You know what that means? That means turn off your iPhone, your iPad, your I, 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 turn off your MacBook, turn off your computer, turn them all off and get on the dinner table and have a meal. When was the last time you ate dinner with the TV off? When, when was the last time y'all sat down and looked at your wife's beautiful almond eyes and said, babe, you are so off? When was the last time you sat down on your dinner table as a family and just had a meal without the interruptions of FaceTime and chat message and all that stuff. The dinner table is one of the most powerful sceneries in your home. It's a place where you can sit down and talk to your children. A place where your children can, 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 can vent, and can say, man, my day wasn't so good, and for the parent not to get upset. It's also a place for the parent to show their children that they're not superheroes that they too have flaws. It's a place where the family come together and acknowledge Jesus as Lord of the house. It's one of the best places to do church. My family and I, we have like a, 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 a theme scripture in our home, and it's in the book of Proverbs. And it says this, uh, uh, better is a dinner of herbs than a fatted calf with hate. You know what that means? That means better is salad. Yay, salad! Praise the Lord! <laughs> better is a table of salad with love than steak and fillet mignon and a lobster with hate. And the dinner table is an amazing way to, ex is an amazing place to express the love of Jesus. It's really not about the food. It's about the fellowship with your family. Somebody say amen. Okay, so do not forsake the dinner table when you go home today and it's like, you know what? I like that pastor preacher. Bam, I'm, I'm going to go home. We're going to set up the table. We're going to have dinner time and we're just going to fellowship and share the love of God. Here's the other thing. Call each other by name, not by nemesis. Call each other by name. Ooh, that's my babe. That's my girl. Her name is Helen. And she's all that in a bag of chips. She's my caramel in my macchiato. Without her, my life won't taste as good. She is all that. She's the barbecue sauce on my spare ribs. That's my girl. That's my honey. That's my babe. That's Helen. Well, that's my man. What a man. What a man. What a mighty good man. He is all that in a bag of, of chips. In fact, God said in the book of Jeremiah 33, 3 to call him because his word says to call him and he will answer. So I called God and I said, God, did you lose an angel? Because I think I married him. <laughs> He's right here. I'm keeping him. <laughs> I ain't letting go of that ego. That's all mine. When was the last time you talked to your spouse like that? What comes out? Oh, you're no good for nothing. Jesus, you forgot the lettuce? He said salad. You brought rice? What's wrong with you? Call each other by name. God has given you a name. God has given you. And then listen, this is why. We already get beat up at work. Amen. We get beat up at work. We get beat up in life. We get beat up at school. When we come home, the last thing we want to do is get beat up again. Oh, you're no good for nothing. You can't get anything. You don't want that. You want to say, oh, honey, welcome. You preach so well today. You, you, those denim look so good. I'll come, babe. Sit down. I got you salad. Yay. Call each other by name. There's a story about um, oh, one day uh, Eve thought that, that, that Adam had been running around with other women on earth. And so when Adam came home from a long day of work of naming the animals, right? now, when Adam first started naming the animals, he was really creative. He said, hippopotamus, <laughs> ostrich. And then later on, like about six at night, he got tired. Cat, dog, dog, bat. 
<laughs> so he got tired, so he came home from the long days working, and, and Eve was like, you're running around with women on earth, other women. And, and Adam was like, babe, th- you're the only woman here. Anyway, she wouldn't receive it, so Adam was like, I'm done. So Adam goes and he climbs up a tree and he just goes to sleep. In the middle of the night, he feels someone poking on his side. He gets up, it's Eve, poking on his side, and he says, what are you doing? And Eve is like, I'm counting your ribs, making sure God didn't make another woman. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. It's okay to laugh in church. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we got to call each other by name. Uh, uh, we got to demonstrate the love of God. Like that, that, that man, he took on the name that wasn't given to him by his family. He took on the name of Legion. You don't want to leave your house thinking that you're a loser or you thinking that you're not good enough, thinking that you're inadequate as a spouse. You don't, you don't want to leave your house like that. And so counter that spirit in the name of Jesus by speaking encouraging, edifying, freedom type of language so that those who leave your house and come to your house can feel refuge, safety, and the love of Jesus. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Okay, so last one. So call each other by name, not by nemesis. And number three. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Give each other the precious gift of you. Give each other the precious gift of you. Your wife don't want Jason Momoa. She ain't all that. You all that. Give your family the precious gift of you. When this guy was delivered by Jesus, he wanted to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Your family needs you. Go to your house. No, no, but, but, but I, want, I want to do missions. And I want, I want, I want, I want to plant churches. No, 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 no. No, how can you take care of a house of God if you can't take care of your own home? Go first, establish my name and my kingdom in your living room. Go to your house. Your family needs you. Your spouse needs you. Your children need you. Your uncle needs you. Crazy Uncle Shiona needs you. Your family needs the one that no one likes to invite to the parties. Crazy Uncle Shiona needs you. Don't go here. Don't go to missionary. Don't go here. Go first to your house and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in your living room. Somebody say amen. You see, the truth is that your family doesn't need a bigger house. Your family doesn't need more cars. Your family doesn't need more trucks. Your family doesn't need you to get promotions. Your family just needs you. That's all they want is you, your undivided time, your undivided attention. All of you, not you at work, not you preaching the gospel. They want you. They don't want another car. They don't want another paycheck. They, they just want you, your family wants you. You know why? Because you are so precious to them. Your family can afford to run out of milk, but they cannot afford to run out of you. Amen. They, they can afford for a light bulb to go off, but they cannot afford for you to go off. Your family needs you. I wish I had a witness in this building to give God praise and glory knowing that your family wants you. Come on, somebody praise the Lord. Smile at your neighbor. (laughs) Say, I'm all that in a bag of chips. Y'all need me. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, y'all need me. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So listen, family is a first ministry. Take this and do it at home. Establish the kingdom of God in your living room. Shine the light of Jesus. How? Don't forsake the dinner table. Go home, have some salad, and enjoy it with one or another. Amen. If it doesn't taste good, we'll maybe pronounce it in a fancy way. Like Tarjay, salad. Well, maybe it sounds really good. (laughs) We'll call each other by name, not by nemesis. And then lastly, give each other the precious gifts of you. Do church without walls by doing church at home as family. In Jesus' name. Y'all receive that. Come on, somebody say amen. Praise the Lord. Would you please rise with me? Name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Tell your neighbor that was good. Okay. Tell the other neighbor you want to talk to that that was good, because hardly, hardly anybody said that was good. Tell your neighbor that was good. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I want to just take the opportunity for a couple of things. If you felt that, man, I, I've been missing the mark. My, my, my job is bearing much fruits because I've been spending more of me at my job. Maybe this sermon, this message just sort of gave you some perspective. of Like, wow, have I neglected my family? Don't beat yourself up because there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But like a surgeon, you know, what God wants to do is he, he just finds that one area and then he addresses it. Not so that you feel condemned about your mistakes or your flaws, but really for the purpose of healing you and restoring you. Or maybe you found yourself in like, um, you were once at home, but you felt like you wandered away from the principles and values of God. And you find yourself in the tombs of life, constantly getting pushed and pulled, and right now not knowing who you are anymore. And you've been biting the lies of Satan, saying you are defined by this and that. And all those are deceptions and they're not true. You are defined by what God says about you. You are loved. Period. And so what I've known about the gospel is that it does require a response. Do you have a response for Jesus this morning? Do you have a response of praise, of worship? Do you have a response of repentance, pounding your chest? Or maybe you have never heard of Christ Jesus, and you're like, who is this? I... I feel like the demon-possessed demon man who's lost it. I, I want to know him. And I want to give my life to him. And so let's start off with this. Let's start off with, if there is anyone in here that has never said yes to receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I want you just to raise your hand. If there is anyone in here that has never said yes to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Okay, good. Okay, good. 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 Okay, the other question then is this. If you feel that you've kind of wandered like, man, I, I don't think I've given my undivided attention to my family. Um, and you feel that, you know what, today I'm going to recommit. Today I'm going to dust myself off. For the word of God says that a righteous man falls seven times. So yes, righteous people do fall. Uh, but he gets back up. So today I'm just going to give it another shot. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better spouse. I'm going to be a better wife. I'm going to be a better child. And so if you feel that, man, I, I, I want to make things right again. I want to recommit. Amen. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Oh, praise the Lord. Come on, lift up your hand. Hallelujah. Good, 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 good. Lift up your hand. Hi, 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 up in there. Okay. So I'm just going to pray, all right? Thank you, Lord. Lift up your hands so I can see you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Let's do church at home, right? Amen? Okay. So right now, as, as the music plays, I just want us to engage everything that you've heard about today and just kind of ponder on the Lord. And, and, and first of all, there, 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 there has to be a turning. Amen. There has to be like, okay. If I, if I, if I want to make things right, I got, I got to turn. And I, I, I got to go back to doing what God has called me to do. And so there has to be a turning. And so in the name of Jesus, Lord, there is a shifting. There is a turning. We are turning back unto you who is the author and the finisher of our faith in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge that we had missed the mark again. But I thank you, Lord, that you don't condemn us, but you champion us by turning us around back to our created value and our created purpose. And so, Father God, no more will I look for a light from somebody else to shine my own house. No more will I look for somebody else's light to shine my own house. 
I have your light. So let me shine my light at home. And Father God, your word says that no one shines a light and puts it under a bed, but puts the light on the lampstand for all to see. And so here I am in the name of Jesus, shine brighter and brighter as I stand on your word in Jesus' name. So I pray a blessing. I pray freedom in the name of Jesus. I pray all things have passed away. The loosening of chains and bondages in the name of sea of Jesus. The loosening of the labels that society have placed on us in the name of Jesus. We are fit. We are qualified. You have called us and you have chosen us. Yes, I am a child of God and I believe in him and I follow him in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Let's join us in worship.